I am uh, have the pleasure of introducing our Grand Rounds uh, speaker uh, today, Marty Tallman. Uh, every, I think most people here know him or know uh, who he is, but just to remind everyone, Marty um, uh, did uh, his post-residency training at the Hutch, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, Fred Applebaum uh, was, was his mentor and he came here to Northwestern on the faculty, joined the faculty in 1988 and he was here from 1988 to 2010. Marty uh, has really achieved national, international uh, attention for his work in acute leukemia. He was chair of the ECOG Leukemia Group from 1995 to 2013. And really, Marty had the first seminal study um, in uh, APL uh, using, using, after this was an ECOG, a cooperative, large cooperative group study published in the New England Journal. Um, went to Memorial Sloan Kettering as uh, chief of the leukemia service. He's been there since from 19, 2010 to now. So right for 12, 12 years as chair of the leukemia service. And he continued to do great work there. He really developed uh, uh, their service over that time. And we are very fortunate uh, to have him back here uh, at Northwestern. And uh, Marty is going to talk, update us on uh, on acute leukemia. He, he gave a wonderful grand rounds, uh, I don't know, about a month ago, I think, a medicine grand rounds. So he's we've got him for double duty here. So anyway, Marty, welcome back to Northwestern. Thanks, Leo. Share my screen. Great. Thanks very much, Leo, for the kind introduction. Yes, I had a wonderful experience here, and then I had a wonderful opportunity at Sloan Kettering. And then one of my sons, one of our sons, Sam, had the audacity and with his wife to have a baby girl. And that was enough for my wife to uh, want to relocate back to Chicago. As it turns out, we have another son, Jacob, who is a urology resident in Vanderbilt. And he wanted to do a urologic oncology fellowship and he matched of all places at Sloan. So our timing wasn't great, but uh, I'm very happy to be here. As Leo said, I made, uh, I was asked to give medical grand rounds, Department of Medicine grand rounds uh, a couple months ago. And I titled my presentation, Novel Agents in AML, It's a Brave New World where I talked about some of the excitement and new agents. And then Bill said, would I give Hemant grand rounds? And I said, but I just gave Department of Medicine grand rounds. He said, okay, but you'll be, you'll be fine. So I decided to talk again about novel agents in AML, but I'm going to, with a little bit of chutzpah, I'm going to modify the axiom. All that glitters is not gold, coined by Shakespeare, of course, and ask the question, is all that glitters gold? I do have some obligatory disclosures, some research funding, some royalties. I'll mention briefly some off-label use of drugs. And I sit, as many of us do, on a number of advisory boards. And I have three major objectives over the next 45 minutes or so. I want to describe the prevailing therapeutic paradigm in AML and current outcomes. I'm going to discuss selective novel agents for AML new treatment strategies and changing therapeutic paradigms. And then I'll define what I call the evolving landscape in AML. Now, since the initial description of induction chemotherapy with conventional, was become conventional therapy with cytarabine and donorubicin, there have been arguably three major practice changing advances, allogeneic transplantation, cytarabine consolidation, and donorubicin intensification. And there have been some refinements in those three advances. First of all, donorubicin intensification, we know now that 90 milligrams per meter squared is safe, although a recent abstract at ASH suggested that 90 may, may be equivalent to 60, which I think is the the uh, typical dose of donorubicin. We have a little more information about cytarabine consolidation. And of course, we now recommend 
allogeneic transplantation for patients with AML in first remission for those with intermediate and adverse risk disease, preferably if they're minimal residual disease negative. Now that was as emerged as the prevailing therapeutic paradigm in AML. Um, and that's what it is uh, currently for most patients. And this shows you the current Kaplan-Meier estimates for overall survival that are achieved with those advances and that therapeutic paradigm. These are data from the SEER registry, a population-based registry. And this first set of curves shows you in the last four decades, the improvement in outcome, overall survival for all ages, all subtypes of AML. As you can see, there's been what I would say is quite modest improvement uh, when you look at all ages. Now, there's no denying that when you look at patients between the ages of 15 and 39, there's been, I would say, substantial progress in outcomes, substantial improvement in overall survival. But that's as good as it gets. If you look at patients between the ages of 40 and 59, I would say there's moderate, not adequate, not satisfactory, but moderate, moderate improvement in overall survival. This shows you SEER data on overall survival for patients between 60 and 69. And as you can see, there's been very modest, I would say, improvement in overall survival over the last four decades. And then interestingly, when you look at patients between the ages of, let me just minimize everyone's picture so I can see better. Here we go. Um, if you look at patients 70 years old and older, over the last four decades, there is barely any evidence that there's been any improvement in overall survival. If you believe, if you want to believe that the purple curve, the most recent data, suggests that there's any improvement, it's most likely related to improvements and changes in supportive care than actual changes in the natural history of the disease. Well, it's not advancing. Okay, press your screen and then like try again. I'm oh, sorry, thanks. Um, but I wanna raise the question whether these curves are misleading in any way. And I do wanna mention that for two reasons. First of all, what if one looked at pages between the ages of 70 and 80 compared to patients over 80? Most importantly, has HMA venetoclax had any significant impact, which these curves probably don't reflect? There's a hint that hypomethylating agents plus venetoclax may have had an impact based on an abstract from the Mayo Clinic in which they described 20 patients who are age 80 or older treated with hypomethylating agents and venetoclax where the complete remission rate was about 81% and the median duration of remission was nine months. So I think there's a suggestion that these curves in a way may be misleading and may not be even contemporary enough. And just corroborating this shows you the Swedish AML registry data. This is a mandatory registry in Sweden where virtually every patient with acute myeloid leukemia is, uh, is registered, another population-based registered registry, registry. And there, these are patients who are over the age of 75, again, showing not a suggestion, not a hint of any improvement in overall survival over the last 40 years very sobering set of curves. Now that's not to say there hasn't been any progress. Of course there's been progress. And in my view, these are the six areas of the most progress. First of all, there have been major insights into the genetic pathogenesis of the disease and integrated genetic profiling. There's been the important recognition of inherited familial predisposition syndromes. The important area, burgeoning area, of course, of drug discovery and targeted therapy, expanded availability and advances in transplantation. There's been a real paradigm shift in our approach to older adults and those less fit. 
And of course, has been the increased importance of the identification of minimal and now what we call measurable residual disease. And regarding insights into the genetic pathogenesis, I've listed here what I think are the 10 most important uh, genetic studies that should be done in all patients with AML in everyday practice. Uh, we at Sloan Kettering, and I'm sure uh, now at Northwestern, in fact, I know from, of course, Jessica and Yasmin and others, that you send um, panels, 40, 40 gene panel and, and more. And, and we did too. We had a panel of 450 genes, which I think is in a way was uh, unnecessary. But you could argue about some more to be added, but these are the 10 that I think are important in everyday practice. The first seven are important because they are clinically actionable in some way. They're not really effectively, in my view, actionable, but they are clinically actionable. And the last three are important for prognostic importance. And the important ones for that are clinically actionable, of course, are FLT3, ITD, and TKD, NPM1, the BZIP, CC, BP alpha, CKIT, IDH1 and 2, and TP53. And the three that I think that are most important prognostically are RUNCS1, ASX01, and TEP2. And I've listed here on this table the incidence, relative incidence of these gene mutations, the association, as important associations, and the impact of the gene mutation on the associated gene. Most, of course, are unfavorable. There's several that are favorable. So these are the 10 that I think are most important that should be obtained on every patient with newly diagnosed AML. And I don't want to get too detailed uh, in terms of the uh, ELN changes, classification changes, but I do want to mention uh, a few that I think are important, even for the non leukemologist First of all, the ELN, the European Leukemia Net 2022 classification, has made changes in the BLAST threshold, threshold that defines AML. Now, all current, all recurrent genetic abnormalities define AML if they exist in at least 10% of BLASTs occurring in the blood of the BZIP CBP alpha. Secondly, there's a new category, and that is there are three particular subgroups that are defined by as AML if they have 20% blasts, but MDS AML if they have 10 to 19% blasts. And these are mutated TP53, AML with MDS-related mutations, and AML with MDS-related cytogenetic changes. So the important point, the most important point that I wanted to make people aware of is that now we define AML if you have 10% or more blasts in the blood of the bone marrow. It's no longer 20%, it's 10% with defined recurrent genetic abnormality. And a few other changes, particularly to the risk classification. First of all, you may be familiar, of course, with FLT3 ITD. We used to use the ratio, but it was unavailable in most institutions. So the ELN has eliminated the FLT3, FLT3 ratio and all ITD patients, all FLT3 ITD patients are now classified as intermediate risk. Secondly, AML with myelodysplasia-related gene changes are now adverse risk. Adverse cytogenetics in TP53, which is otherwise favorable, is now adverse. The BZIP CBP alpha is favorable risk. And then a little less critical for today's discussion, some several more adverse disease-defining cytogenetic abnormalities. So these are just a few, I think, of the most important changes to the ELN risk classification. Well, let me give you a feel of the remarkable variability in splay and outcome, overall survival, uh, for the patients that have various gene fusions, no gene fusions, just genetic mutations, and some with no driver mutation. If you look at the gene fusions, for those of you that don't take care of these patients every day, you can see there's been a dramatic change in outcome in patients that have, for example, in version 16 and T15, 17, compared to the red curve at the bottom in version three, 
I'm not sure we cure anybody with inversion three. There may be an occasional patient, but with any novel agent, novel regimen, transplantation, inversion three is a very, very difficult disease, and I'm not sure we cure anybody. But look at the dramatic difference in outcome with contemporary therapeutic strategies. The same is true for patients in the middle set of curves with no gene fusions, but with single gene mutations. You can see that the top green curve, patients that have CBP alpha have a reasonably favorable outcome compared to patients with TP53. And you can see at the bottom, I'm not sure we cure many patients either with TP53. These are data that were generated from my colleague, Ellie Pep Emanuel at Sloan. And finally, at the far right, you can see the set of curves for patients that have either no driver mutations or driver mutations, but are not class defining. So dramatic difference in outcome, according to patients based on their genetic abnormalities. And of course, I always tell the residents and fellows, we judge a person by the company he or she keeps. And now I say we judge a gene by the company it keeps. It's not important only to know, of course, the single gene mutation, but we have to know all the genes that are present in that cell because it's a very important interaction. And let me give you just a couple of examples. On this slide, this shows you the difference in outcome if FLT3 ITD is present or absent based on associated NPM1 or DNMT3. If the uh, DNMT3 and NPM1 are wild type, you can see that the presence of IT, FLT3 ITD does not, is not influential. But if you look at the far right, you can see that there's a dramatic difference in outcome if you have a FLT3 ITD if and only if NPM1 is mutated and DNMT3A is mutated. And this is just a second example that uh, is typical I wanted to make you aware of. These are patients that have T53. Um, mutations, which often is seen associated with complex karyotype. You can see the top gray curve. These are patients that are wild type for TP53 and have no complex karyotype. And if you look at the very bottom blue curve, you can see these are those are patients that have TP53 mutation and a complex karyotype. So complex karyotype serves to be very influential in the presence of TP53. For patients that don't have a, a complex karyotype, the middle orange curve, but have a TP53 mutation, TP53 is not good. It has a bad reputation, which it deserves, but it's not as bad as those patients that have an associated complex karyotype. So the main message is that it's important to know all the genes and cytogenetics associated with each other. Now, the identification of gene mutations and fusions, of course, paved the way in part for the identification and development of nine new drugs in AML. So for 44 years, since the original description in 1973 until 2017, there was not a single new sustained drug approval. But in a short four years between 2017 and 2022, there were nine new drugs that are approved. And these are the drugs seen here. Mitostorin, which is now approved for, is a FLT3 inhibitor for induction and consolidation and maintenance. It's approved in Europe. Giltaritinib, another FLT3 inhibitor, a second generation FLT3 inhibitor for relapse and refractory disease. The IDH1 and 2 inhibitors, Ivocidinib and Enacidinib for relapse and refractory disease and de novo disease, Ivocidinib. Venetoclax, I think, is the most important uh, of all these new drugs. Uh, is the BCL2 inhibitor. It's associated. Uh, it's uh, approved for patients with untreated disease who are 75 years old and older or those with comorbidities who are not suitable candidates for uh, chemotherapy. Glastogib, which I won't talk any more about, which hasn't received much traction at all, is a smoothened receptor inhibit inhibitor. Gentuzumab azogamycin, you may be familiar with, is the anti-CD33 immunoconjugate. It is fairly broad, the most broad approval for those with CD33 positive disease and those with favor, particularly with favorable and intermediate 
risk disease and those with relapsed and refractory disease. CPX351 is not really a new novel agent. It's a new formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin. It's approved for therapy-related AML and AML with myelodysplasia-related changes. And finally, CC486 or orally cytidine methyltransferase inhibitor is approved for patients in first remission who are ineligible for curative consolidation therapy or transplant. So these are the nine new drugs that were approved in a short four years for the treatment of various phases and subgroups of AML. Now, the use of novel agents has evolved uh, in the following way. There are several agents that are approved as a single agent, such as CPX351 and CC486. There are several novel agents that are approved in combination with chemotherapy, both intensive chemotherapy, for example, FLIP3 inhibitor, and, um, uh, and uh, some are approved for less intensive, low intensive therapy, such as venetoclax. There are novel, novel combination doublets, such as that are being explored, such as venetoclax and gilteritinib. And there are novel, novel chemo triplets that are uh, being studied, such as FLT3 inhibitor with venetoclax and the hypomethylene agent, the cytobine. As I mentioned at the outset, we have nine new drugs and it's become routine in not just AML, but I think in many areas, and as soon as a drug is approved, it's widely adopted and it changes practice. And the question is, um, does it really have the most important achievement? Is it, does it really have a clinically meaningful impact? And I'm gonna raise the question that I'm not sure uh, several of these do. And let me start and give you the first example with the FLT3 inhibitor mitostorin, the first generation inhibitor. This is the RATIFY trial. I tried to simplify the schema. It was a prospective randomized clinical trial of donorubicin cytarabine with or without the FLT3 inhibitor mitostorin. It was placebo controlled. The mitostorin was given in induction. It was given in consolidation, once in remission, and it was given for 12 months as maintenance therapy. So prospective randomized trial, uh, very uh, well designed. And this is the outcome curve. Uh, as you can see, mitostorin, uh, patients in the mitostorin group and a more statistically significantly more favorable uh, overall survival than those patients who got placebo. Now, as you can see, there's not a dramatic difference, but there was a statistically significant different uh, outcome. And in fact, this was the first agent that was uh, received um, approval uh, of the nine, the first agent to receive sustained regulatory approval in almost 50 years. And it changed practice, no question. And it changed the therapeutic paradigm, no question. But I wanna ask the question, will it have a clinically meaningful impact? And let me give you a few reasons why one could raise that question. First of all, the overall survival increase, as you saw, was only about 7%. Yes, I guess I'd rather be in that top blue curve than the red curve, but uh, it's only a 7% improvement in overall survival. Secondly, the benefit was seen more in the FLT3 TKD patients than the ITD, and TKD has a more favorable outcome than ITD patients. And in fact, um, the TKD uh, is certainly less common and uh, is less prognostically important. I, uh, thirdly, there was a interesting genetic variability. Men, the overall survival in men was benefited by uh, expressing the TKD, but not the, not the ITD, but not the TKD. And women had a, ten for, had a trend toward a benefit in overall survival for the TKD, but not the ITD. What's the explanation for that? Completely unknown. It's not clear which phase of treatment is important, if not all three. Maybe you only have to give the FLT3 inhibitor an induction uh, for an initial uh, bulk cell kill. Maybe, maybe it's consolidation that's important. 
uh, when, there's, when there's minimal residual disease, maybe maintenance is important. So it's not clear which phase, if not all three, the drug uh, is, is useful. Metastorin is the first generation. It's among the least potent of the FLT3 inhibitors. There are much more potent inhibitors that are available. The role in maintenance therapy has been studied and is completely unclear. And finally, a little bit of a more nuanced point. Having an associated NPM1 mutation in the setting of FLT3 makes the FLT3 less unfavorable. And yes, there was a beneficial effect to mitostorin in the patients who are wild-type NPM1 FLT3, but there was also a benefit in patients that were NPM1 positive. So I'm just suggesting that there could be some improvement in outcome based on its effect on NPM1 and not at all its effect on the, on the uh, FLT3. But I admit, and I put it in bold because it's what I do, uh, all FLT3 mutated patients, ITD or TKD, now get 7 and 3 plus mitostorin and induction consolidation, and then allogeneic transplant or maintenance therapy. A second generation of FLT3 inhibitor, quizartinib, has recently been reported in a randomized trial by Harry Erb at the EHA meeting. He reported the important study of quizartinib plus chemotherapy versus placebo plus chemotherapy. And they showed a benefit in, main, in uh, the quizartinib treated patients with an overall survival benefit of 32 months versus 15 months in the placebo and a somewhat improvement in the composite complete remission rate of 72% versus 65%. And this sounds appealing, and in some ways it is, but I raised the question of if the control group was correct, because the standard of care now is mitostorin plus um, chemotherapy, not placebo plus chemotherapy. So I think it unfortunately casts some doubt on the importance of this clinical trial. On the ratified trial, the prospective randomized trial of mitostorin versus placebo uh, in FLT3 positive patients was um, only for patients between the ages of 15, uh, 18 and 60. And people are very interested to know if the benefit was accrued and realized in patients older than 60. And this is a phase two study conducted in Germany, the AMLSG 1610 trial compared the results to historical controls. And as you can see, these are for patients younger than 60, 60 and younger and over 60. And there was a benefit in patients over the age of 60, and also a benefit for those patients uh, who were censored, whose outcome was censored uh, of allogeneic transplant in first remission. So the drug is useful for patients under the age of 60 and over the age of 60. Now, a second example, um, asking the question, is all that glitters gold, is that, that of gemtuzumab azogamycin. This is the immunoconjugate of the anti-CD33 monoclonal antibody linked to the potent tox cytotoxic agent colichiamycin. And actually, I've said before that, that the um, mitostorin was the first sustained agent approved in the last 45 years. And I use the word sustained because, in fact, in 2010, gemtuzumab azogamycin was approved for first relapse older adults with AML, but it was subsequently withdrawn from the market because uh, further studies uh, showed it to be toxic and not effective. But it was reapproved, and this was a study that led to its reapproval. This is the French Alpha Group, the 0701 trial, in which they combined gemtuzumab azogamycin with intensive induction chemotherapy and consolidation, and they showed a statistically significant improvement in event-free survival, event-free survival, not overall survival, for those patients who received um, the addition of gemtuzumab azogamycin. Um, gemtuzumab azogamycin used to be given in a larger, higher dose every two weeks, but this trial in this trial, the investigators reduced the dose and fractionated the schedule 
day one, four, and seven, and showed significantly reduced toxicity. This is the drug that's associated with the sinusoidal obstruction syndrome or the old venoocclusive disease that we saw with the allogeneic transplant. And um, uh, that toxicity was reduced to 4.6% from 8 or 9%. So they showed reduced toxicity, but no benefit in overall survival. There was another, another study that showed a benefit in favorable risk patients and a trend in intermediate risk patients, but not any improvement in overall in uh, adverse risk patients. Yet another study conducted by the SWAG showed no benefit in overall survival in younger patients. And another study by the British group showed there was a benefit in older patients, but the benefit, as you can see here, was quite modest and just met statistical significance. And it's important to note, as I mentioned, that the risk of sinusoidal obstruction syndrome or the venoocclusive disease was in, is in about 8% after an allograft, and it's higher if the allograft is performed within three months of gentuzumab exposure. So the results here are quite mixed. And in fact, Robert Hills and Alan Burnett conducted and presented a meta-analysis. I don't really care for meta-analysis, but they did a meta-analysis of five prospective randomized trials of gentuzumab as mycin. And the complete remission rate was not improved in any of them, essentially. The overall survival benefit was observed in two of the five, and as I showed you in the last slide, only marginal in one. And two of the studies were conducted and presented by the UK MRC group in the United Kingdom. And these studies, when you read them carefully, are very complicated with multiple randomizations within randomizations within randomizations. So again, I put in bold what I do, and that is, I think, Gemtuzumab has a role in high-risk APL, although I tend to prefer idorubicin, but it, I certainly have given it in high-risk APL. And then the favorable risk core binding factor leukemias, but in fact, not in any other subgroup of patients untreated. Now, a third example is that of CPX351. CPX351 is not, as I mentioned, a new novel agent, but it's a novel formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin in a fixed five to one molar ratio. Apparently, not totally clear why, but apparently when the, these two drugs in a certain ratio enters the cell and increases the cell kill, depending on the relationship, the ratio of one to the another. So this is a prospective randomized trial of CPX351 compared to donorubicin and cytarabine in patients with secondary uh, AML that had been shown to benefit in prior studies. And as you can see, this is presented by Dr. Jeff Lancet and colleagues. And as you can see, there was a statistically significant benefit in overall survival for those patients who received CPX351, the five to one molar ratio in a lipid formulation of donorubicin cytarabine compared to standard donorubicin and cytarabine. And there was a statistically significant improvement in response rate. As you can see here, for those patients who received CPX351, they had a better complete remission rate, 37.3% compared to 25.6%. And in composite complete remission, 47.7% compared to 33.3%. So a reasonable improvement in complete remission. And this shows you that there is the genetic landscape influences response to CPX351. This, these are oncoprints generated from um, my colleague, my junior colleague, Dr. Aaron Goldberg and Dr. Talati at the uh, Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. And as you can see here, Aaron and colleagues showed that uh, if you have, uh, for those patients that had an IDH1 and, or 2 mutation or an NPM1 mutation, that was uh, positively influential in the outcome. And you compare that to patients who have a P53 mutation or a CBL mutation, who uh, those patients were predicted to be non-responders. So the genetic mutations influence the response to CPX351. Now in a post hoc analysis, 
I think one of the most interesting, uh, and we hope reliable, one of the most interesting observations was made. And Jeff Lancet and his colleagues looked at those patients who went on to transplant in each arm. And he found that those patients who went on to transplant who had received CPX351 had a much more favorable outcome than those patients who went on to transplant uh, and were treated with standard cytarabine and donorubicin. And here's another example of CPX351 has changed practice, no question. And the therapeutic paradigm has changed, no question. But again, I raise the question, will it have a clinically meaningful impact? For the life of me, I, don't I still don't understand why CPX351 should be more effective in therapy-related AML and AML with MRC than non-therapy-related AML, de novo AML standard. It doesn't make sense. If it's a more effective in a more difficult disease to treat, why isn't it effective in the less difficult disease to treat? Second question I'd like to ask is, why is the outcome after allogeneic transplant better with CPX351 than with 7 and 3? One possibility is that there's, it provides a deeper remission. That would be terrific if it does. Another possibility is that maybe it confers less toxicity pre-transplant. And finally, an important question is, will CPX351 be effective either alone or when combined with other agents? I gave you one example of P53, but other agents uh, in adverse subtypes. And here's one uh, hint at that. Here's another study by Aaron Goldberg and colleagues who looked at um, patients who had the T53 mutation who received CPX351 as standard therapy. And as you can see, the patients who had wild type where wild type for TP53 had a much more favorable outcome. So having P53 mutation, I wouldn't say not to give them CPX351, but you have to recognize that the outcome will be much less favorable. So the degree to, to which such a drug will have a clinically meaningful impact, I think is, is uh, not totally clear. Next example is patients with IDH mutations. IDH1 and 2. And this is a study presented by Courtney DiNardo from the MD Anderson Cancer Center and colleagues. And remember that IDH1 and 2 are approved for those patients with relapse and refractory mutated uh, disease. And in this study, Courtney and colleagues asked the question, is the outcome better if they clear the mutation with the ibocytinib in IDH1 mutated patients? And this shows you that the duration of complete remission and overall survival were both better in those patients who cleared the mutation after treatment, who achieved remission and cleared the mutation. As you can see, uh, the number of patients, of course, was small. As it turns out, only about a third of patients will clear the mutation. But these data suggested that we should do more than give single agent ibocytinib, that we should combine ibocytinib or enosidinib with intensive chemotherapy. That's certainly a logical strategy. And this is a study, an important study led by another co colleague of mine, Eitan Stein and colleagues. And uh, Eitan and his colleagues combined the ibocytinib and enosidinib inhibitors with intensive standard induction consolidation chemotherapy. And I show you the remission rate, composite remission rate, and the overall com and the complete remission rate, as you can see, was, was uh, quite good for overall patients, for patients with de novo disease, and even with those with secondary disease. But obviously, we need randomized prospective, randomized, well-designed trials of chemotherapy with or without the inhibitors, ibocytinib or enosidinib. Let me give you an example of the evolution in studies for ibocytinib. Um, in a small study, it was shown that ibocytinib as monotherapy in relapse and refractory disease induced a remission rate of about 30%, composite remission rate of about 42%. Ibocytinib was then combined with azacitidine, the hypomethylating agent, with a significant improvement in a very small study, a significant improvement in the overall in complete remission rate of 61%. And you can see the overall response rate was outstanding at 
and the IDH mutation clearance rate was about 93%. And finally, a prospective randomized trial called the Agile trial randomized patients with, uh, I, with the IDH1 mutation to azacitidine with or without ibocidinib. And there was an improvement in event-free survival and overall survival in those patients who received the doublet of azacitidine and ibocidinib with a median survival of, seven, of 24 months versus 7.9 months. But again, I raised the important question, is the control group adequate. The control group now would be azacitidine plus venetoclax. And the second problem was that almost no patients received ibocidinib at relapse, which would have been the standard therapy. So I think, again, the Agile trial, there were problems with it, and this interpretation becomes more difficult. Um, but clearly, uh, ibocidinib and acidinib are approved for relapse and refractory disease, and they're readily used in that setting. In de novo IDH1 mutated patients, we prefer azacitidine plus venetoclax since IDH1 mutated patients respond very well, or possibly azacitidine plus ibocidinib. And I put in bold again what I do rightly or wrongly, I don't add ibocidinib or even to HMA plus venetoclax outside the context of a clinical trial, nor do I combine ibocidinib or even with induction chemotherapy, which is being done in the community, but I'm not sure it's, uh, we know whether that's the right thing to do yet, uh, again, outside the context of a clinical trial. Uh, venetoclax, I think, is uh, the most important of the nine new drugs. For those of you that don't take care of these patients, this has been a major, major advance. It certainly has changed the therapeutic paradigm. And a lot of our prognostic factors that we've known for many years were identified on the basis of chemotherapy. But now we have to reevaluate our prognostic factors on the basis of venetoclax plus hypomethylating agents. And just to give you a feel again, for those of you that don't take care of these patients all the time, if you look at the middle column, you can see that there are outstanding results, uh, whether uh, irrespective of the cytogenetic risk, age, whether the AML is de novo or secondary, and importantly, irrespective of most of the mutations, even TP53 patients respond reasonably well, but other mutations, as you can see, respond quite well. One of the other important benefits of this regimen, of course, is that the responses and complete remissions almost always occur within one or two cycles. And the identification of the combination of azacitidine plus venetoclax led, of course, to this important seminal prospective randomized trial, azacitidine plus venetoclax versus azacitidine plus placebo, showing a statistically significant improvement in overall survival. And this has emerged as a new standard of care. Because this is a new regimen for induction, I've listed a few of what I call tricks of the trade. Again, I think this is mostly applicable for those of you that do take care of these patients. And I know that, that uh, my colleagues there, Jessica and Yasmin and others, Shira, uh, are well aware of all of these. Um, tumor lysis is very uncommon with azacitinine plus venetoclax and AML, but many practicing clinicians will admit patients to initiate the first cycle. We have to reduce the dose of concomitant azoles when you give venetoclax. Um, uh, we normally continue the venetoclax for 28 days in cycle one without interruption for cytopenias, but it's now become fairly routine practice to do a bone marrow quite early on day 14 or 21 of cycle one. And if there's no decrease in blast, even by that time, we consider abandoning the therapy and choosing alternative strategies. And if there's marrow aplasia, which we hope for, we know now that we have to hold the dose of the venetoclax until a recovery for cycle two. Another relatively new observation has been that we now need to uh, decrease the duration of the venetoclax once in remission to seven or 14 days for each 
28-day cycle to avoid prolonged cytopenias. We also occasionally give GCSF if there's prolonged neutropenia. And again, if there's no remission by one or two cycles, we consider abandoning therapy. And the last example I want to mention uh, is an example of um, as all that glitters gold is the uh, use of CC486. CC486 is oral azacitidine. We've known for many years that maintenance therapy can improve disease-free survival, but there's never been a study showing any treatment prolongs overall survival in AML once in remission. But this was the first study that we said to do so. And this was a prospective randomized trial of patients 55 years old and older who were in first remission and were not able to complete appropriate consolidation chemotherapy or undergo a transplant. As you can see in this prospective trial, there was an improvement in outcome for the oral azacitidine patients compared to placebo of 24.7 months versus 14.8 months. So this, to their credit, to the investigator's credit, this was done by Andrew Wee, uh, and a follow-up study by Gail Robose. This is a prospective phase three placebo controlled control trial for AML and first remission for patients ages 55 and older. And it did show an improvement in overall survival independent of minimal residual disease. And it's an oral agent to boot. But important to recognize that the pretreatment was not prescribed and varied. Some patients received no consolidation, some patients one cycle, some patients four cycles, for example. Secondly, patients in relapse with up to 15% blast could continue on the CC46 until more than 15% blasts or if they underwent a transplant. So this is one drug that I know has been adopted fairly widely, and I have to admit that although I know it's approved, I don't use it at all. There are four uh, additional questions that I think we get asked a lot. Uh, you may be familiar with the new regimen of FLAG, IDA plus venetoclax, the novel age of venetoclax has been added to the standard FLAG IDA regimen. And people are asking the question, has it replaced seven and three? And I think, no, it doesn't replace seven and three. There is certainly a role for it, but the numbers of patients in the initial study was very small and there's no prospective randomized trial. Secondly, in newly diagnosed patients with IDH1 mutation, should they be treated with HMA venetoclax or azacitidine plus ivocytidine or ivocytinib alone? I did, I think I addressed this. We prefer HMA plus venetoclax as opposed to azacitidine plus ivocytinib, again, because of the control arm. And, uh, and our third choice would be ivocytin and monotherapy. A third question that we get asked a lot is, in fit patients with newly diagnosed AML with adverse cytogenetics, should we treat with HMA venetoclax or standard seven and three? And what if they're younger than 75, if they're not in the approved age range? And I think that we know that Patients with newly diagnosed AML that have adverse cytogenetics, particularly older adults, do very poorly with standard therapy. So I think many would favor HMA plus venetoclax, even in patients who are younger than age 75, and potential adults younger than 75, and potentially even in very younger patients. And I think we have to wait a trial, which will be initiated soon. And finally, what I call the transplant conundrum. How hard, how hard should you push to achieve MRD negativity in AML and first remission? That is, the patients in first remission, they received consolidation. They um, are still MRD positive. If they proceed to a transplant, their outcome is likely to be less favorable than if they're MRD negative. How hard should we push to achieve MRD negativity in such patients? Well, it's a very difficult question we all struggle with. The likelihood of achieving MRD negativity is mutation dependent. I think most of us rely less on further intensive chemotherapy beyond first remission consolidation. 
and recommend that we proceed to transplant because we know the transplant can cure many of those patients. And we need MRD erasers to be developed. So I have a couple of tables that I summarize. And I think most of this I've talked about. Um, these are for patients. These are recommendations for patients who are not participating on a clinical trial. Um, let me just highlight a few areas. The second column are those for pa those patients who are candidates for intensive chemotherapy. And the last column are those patients who are not candidates for intensive chemotherapy. Core binding chemotherapy, many would add gentuzumab and zogamycin. Um, yeah, however, if someone is pre-transplant for some reason, uh, we might not because of the risk of venal occlusive disease. CD33 positive patients, the same. I don't uh, add um, gemtuzumab and zogamycin, as I mentioned, for the reasons I, I outlined. Um, Therapy-related AML or AML with MRC, we now give, I think, standard CPX351 in induction and consolidation, then proceed to transplant. TP53 mutation is a very difficult area. We simply don't know the best treatment. All of these patients should be in, treated in the context of a clinical trial. One could give intensive chemotherapy. One could give decidabine. One could give decidabine for five days or 10 days. One could give decidabine with or without venetoclax. Clip 3 mutations, mitostorin plus chemotherapy has emerged as the standard of care. Um, IDH1 and 2 and de novo disease, I still think we give chemotherapy without adding the inhibitor. And for relapse and refractory disease, again, I think I mentioned most of these. Um, for those patients that are candidates or not candidates, it's, uh, they're almost the same therapeutic strategy. IDH2 patients now receiving acidinib, IDH1, ivocidinib, GLT3, either gilteritinib or gilteritinib plus venetoclax, an important regimen put forward and led by Jessica. A TP53, I already mentioned it's the same for those with relapse and refractory disease. CD33 chemotherapy or gentuzumab or zogamycin. Um, and uh, for those that have marker negative disease and have no targetable lesion, chemotherapy or HMA, now most likely we would consider HMA plus venetoclax. So finally, let me show you what I think is the, what I call the circuitous road to a clinically meaningful impact of a new disease, a new drug. First of all, the drug, almost every abstract at ASH ends by the saying, by the phrase that uh, this shows promising results. And if it doesn't end with the phrase that the drug shows promising results, the investigators say, say, in this study, results were not as encouraging as we would have hoped, but I think we think in another setting, uh, in a different patient population, the drug would be effective. So a drug initially said to show promising results, then our statistical colleagues suggest that there's statistical significance. Then the drug gets regulatory approval. Then it becomes widely adopted and commonly used. Then it changes practice. But the important endpoint, I think, is will it have a clinically meaningful impact? And this gives me the opportunity to mention uh, my very close friend who we lost last year, Dr. Eli Esty. Many of you know him. He had a very... Um, provocative abstract um, that was presented a number of years ago at ASH. And he and his colleagues looked at oral presentations between 1993 and 2001, early phase trials of new drugs alone or with standard chemotherapy. And Dr. Esty and his colleagues found that 81% of the drugs that re were reported to be positive at ASH in an ASH abstract remained at least five years from the date of that ASH publication either outside the scope of clinical practice or unevaluated in randomized clinical trials. So a number of drugs, another example is that all that glitters is not gold. So let me indicate some conclusions. There are nine new drugs that have been recently approved. Monostorin is a new standard of care, although there are second generation inhibitors that are more potent uh, available now and in randomized trials. 
CPX351 has uh, emerged as a new standard of care for therapy-related AML, AML with MRC. Benetoclax and HMA hypomethylating agents are highly, is a highly effective regimen. It's definitely a new standard of care, a welcome standard of care for old adults, unfit adults, and maybe even younger adults with poor risk disease, and we're awaiting studies to be completed. Importantly, Benetoclax plus hypomethylating agent serves as a backbone for combinations with novel agents. Therapeutic paradigms are changing, but again, I think the clinically meaningful impact is the most important endpoint. And finally, just a few thoughts about the changing landscape of AML in 2022. There's clearly a move toward less chemotherapy, and in fact, away from chemotherapy with targeted strategies. There's a newfound ability to effectively treat older adults, those with poor risk, and those with comorbidities. We have the ability now to revisit maintenance. There's clearly a shift to oral therapies, and the future may be doublets, triplets, and even beyond. And finally, many institutions have identified an increased risk, an increased burden on outpatient delivery of care. There are a lot of people that uh, influence my thinking in AML, and I want to be sure to acknowledge the Leukemia Service and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the ECOG Leukemia Committee. And I recognize this place, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I'm very happy to be a member of both. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Marty, thank you. That was uh, that was wonderful. Let me let me. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, get to everybody's questions. Before I do, I'm glad to see that we're revisiting maintenance. I've always thought that was given up on way too early in the early trials, and uh, I'm mm-hmm. glad to see that's being rethought. So, Jessica, a couple of questions from Jessica. Uh, uh, she asked you, and I think you did uh, talk about <laughs> how do we improve outcomes in TP53 mutated AML and I don't know if you talked about the inversion three or not. Um, any any further thoughts about inversion three? You've talked about TP53 mutated AML, I think. Um, I talked about TP53. I didn't mention a couple of the novel, <clears throat> excuse me, the novel strategies which have been looked at, including APR246 and the megrolimab, the anti-CD70 antibody. Please don't eat me signal. Um, but those are not clear how effective, people are very excited about those for TP53 mutation, but I'm not sure that those drugs that are currently glittering will amount to gold or not. Okay. Version three, Jessica and I talk about this all the time. Um, I'm not, I'm just not convinced we cure anybody. And I really, uh, there was an abstract a few years ago that arsenic which of course has become an important agent in APO. Uh, a couple of uh, blips in the literature suggesting arsenic trioxide may be useful in, in version three. I don't think it's ever been studied, but uh, we certainly need new therapies and every one of those patients should be on the clinical trial. Excellent. And then there's a question, Jamil, I wanted to say how great it is to have you here. And uh, we haven't talked yet. I was out of time when you gave your your grand rounds, but um, yeah. welcome uh, to Northwestern. Uh, yeah. So Jamil has has uh, an important question, really an important question, I think, about what the impact of changing the AML definition, uh, specifically reducing the blast percentage to make it as it's going to be inclusive of patients who we've previously thought of as having MDS with the lead time to AML. So how are we going to reevaluate that given the new definition? Yeah, hi, Jim Ellen, an important question. Um, more of those patients will be included on clinical trials. Um, we'll have to reevaluate the trials in the context of knowing that these patients previously had what we call MDS, but it's an important continuum. And we know there's, I think, ample evidence that patients who have 10, 11, 12% blasts in many cases behave and probably correctly should be treated as AML. Yeah, I just wondered if it would affect the survival uh, curves of AML favorably because obviously you're including people with some lead time to AML. So I wondered how that would affect the survival curve by including those patients. Although to your point, maybe they would behave more like AML to begin with. 
They may, but I think, uh, as you well know, some patients with MDS uh, are very difficult to treat. And uh, I'm not sure that it will result in an improvement in overall survival curve. It may, I think it's difficult to know, it may actually bring down the survival curves. Because, uh, of course, patients uh, that receive chemotherapy for MDS have historically a poor outcome. Thank you. And then finally, I think we have, we'll have time for one more. Sarah is asking, I think, an important practical question. When do you choose Flagida uh, plus Venetoclax versus a standard 7 and 3? Well, I have to be totally honest. I know that a number of my colleagues, Yasmin and I, have talked about this. Uh, my new colleagues, who are actually old friends, uh, have used it occasionally, but I have to be honest. Uh, in general, I do not use Flagida. Some people think that it's more effective than 7 and 3 and given in patients with uh, less favorable prognosis. But in general, it's a rare patient that I use it. So I, in general, I don't use Flagida then over 7 okay. and 3 and, and routinely. Okay. So that's still an unresolved uh, un, uh, issue, I think it sounds like. so. Very much so. Um, Great. And then I think if Jessica had one last question. Uh, should we be transplanting patients with TP53 mutated AML, especially if they're MRD positive going into transplant? My rounds are all on the transplant service, and I see these patients uh, coming back after after their transplant, but plus with graft-versus-host disease. So an important question, Marty. Yeah, no, it's a very important question, as uh, Jessica knows uh, uh, as much as I do about what to do, and she and I have talked about many of these patients. Um, I do not think that patients that are expressed TP53, particularly that are MRD positive, should undergo a routine transplant. I think all those patients must be on a clinical trial, evaluating novel strategies. They just do so poorly with transplant. Or they can go to if they if they proceed to a transplant, they should proceed to a transplant that is asking some new question that is not a routine transplant on a clinical trial. But to me, that's the only situation uh, in which I would uh, recommend that a page, such a patient go to transplant. Maybe post transplant maintenance strategy, for example. But I think a routine transplant, although it's appealing, someone someone says, oh, P53 is a terrible disease, you need a transplant. But I think we'll all agree that, um, in my view, transplant is just not effective. Routine transplant is not effective in such patients. And I wouldn't do it. But I would recommend, if not a clinical trial, a transplant testing some novel strategy. Right. And you know, I kind of agree there's a sense in oncology, in clinical cancer trials and all of oncology, that bad biologic features mean you have to do more treatment and more aggressive treatment. Uh, the, the, the new and more aggressive treatment actually might work better in people with good biologic features. I don't know if we've ever proven we've overcome biology uh, too often in cancer clinical trials. So it's a, a rethinking of the way we think about this. I think. So I completely good point. Um, okay. Well, Marty, that was uh, very nice and a nice set of questions, uh, I think, and important questions. So Thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, uh, in uh, 676 on the wards, uh, in the clinic, or wherever, and the Cancer Center. So, welcome back. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. All right. Good